Hi, uh, welcome to this tasting with myself, Arthur Motley of Raw Mar Whiskies, and Anthony Wills of Kilcoman Distillery, who I will introduce soon. Before we do, I'm just going to run through a few things, a little bit of housekeeping. I think for you guys, it. Um, hang on, two ticks. Uh, I have. Sorry, bear with me one second. We've got the YouTube feed uh, coming through on the volume, so I'm hearing myself. Bear with me one second. Okay, we're sorted. Um, where was I? Sorry about that. Um, so uh, we are tasting the unpeated first, the Loch Gorm, the Amberach, and then the small batch. So the small batch, um, I just wanted to mention that there was a little bit of a snafu at the Kilcoman Distillery, and um, they bottled up and sent out actually uh, a slightly different configuration of uh, miniatures to what we were expecting. So instead of a Fino sherry cask, which we advertised on rawmarskis.com, you all received a small batch number one miniature. Now, we're not sure if that's a big problem for lots of people, but perhaps some folk were really looking forward to that Fino sherry cask. Um, and the Kilcoma guys are lovely and uh, wanted everyone to be happy. So just in case uh, you were very unhappy about that, we've got a couple of paths that you can take in terms of um, uh, to rectify the situation. So either you can get in touch with uh, us at Royal Mile Whiskies with the email address contact at royalmilewhiskies.com and you can ask for a four pound ink fat per pack refund. So effectively what Kilcoman and I are doing uh, uh, giving you uh, the small batch miniature free of charge. Have that drum on us. Um, or if you really, really wanted that Kilcoman uh, Fino sherry cast, then the good folk at Kilcoman will bottle up um, uh, a number of these miniatures uh, and send them over to us. So if you place an order for a bottle of Kilcoman from rawmarwhiskies.com from now effectively and include the code uh, give me Fino, then uh, th there'll be a little uh, gift code, uh, voucher code part on the Royal Marskies website. If you include that code, give me Fino, then we'll slip in a miniature of um, the Kilcoman Fino sample. Um, so, or it may not have bothered you at all and you're fine as you are, which thank you, that's great. <laughs> um, so it is delicious, we'll find that later on. So uh, that was that little thing out of the way. Um, I just want to check a few things from my side. Anthony is waiting in the wings. That's good. Um, so, um, uh, and I just wanted to give a very brief overview of Kilcoman Distillery. Uh, just, I didn't want to assume that um, everyone knows everything about Kilcoman already. We may have a few people who are just discovering it. So a very quick summary of Kilcoman. It was founded in 2005. The first new island distillery to be built for over 142 years, I think it was. So big news, and it was a brave business decision as well. We're used to the idea of lots of new uh, distilleries now in Scotland as the industry has, has done very well. But it, the industry was coming out of the doldrums, and, and the project that uh, Anthony and his team had was watched on to see if it would work, if a distillery could be funded, if uh, the market would buy five or six year old young um, young whiskey. But not only has it survived, it's thrived and they've expanded with adding malting floors uh, where they malt their own barley. We'll talk about that a lot later on. Um, they've expanded capacity with new washbacks, new stills, and uh, they've even added a, a, a very lovely looking um, but very ill-timed visitor center, which um, opened in mid-March, I think. Um, so hopefully we can all go there next year and I think it will still smell and feel very new because not many people will be going there this year, sadly. So um, that's Kilcoman. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a farm distillery, it's independent. It's very closely tied to land around it with their own malting floors. They can produce a, a farm, uh, sorry, a field to bottle Isla single malt whiskey, heavily peated, of course. Uh, and made by very lovely people. So, talking of lovely people, let's um, let's add in Anthony. 
uh, and we can start the tasting proper. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Albert. Nice Great. to see you. Nice to see you too. You're you're coming through loud and clear. You you Great. joined us after a few early technical hitches, so you got that out of the way. So that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> how's life on Isla? It must be yeah. uh, a quieter May than usual. Uh, yeah, it's pretty strange really here at the moment. Um, the roads very quiet. There's uh, not a lot of uh, visitors. Uh, well, no visitors really. Um, so yeah, it's pretty unusual um, for for Isla to be this quiet in May in the in the lead up to. The, uh, the festival which obviously uh, would have been starting on, on Saturday. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all a bit strange, but uh, we're getting on with life and we're, we're quite busy at the distillery, though there's few of us there. Um, and, um, yeah, we're, we're taking care of things and, and hopefully things will turn around and, and we'll be stronger for it. Yeah, you'll be ready, I'm sure. Um, okay, great. Well, I think there's a few thirsty people out there. So... Uh, I've already explained the order that we're going to be tasting the dram. So starting with the unpeated, um, which was the one that really excited me to be able to try. Um, and the uh, first time I'd tried unpeated Kilcoman, but I suppose we have to we have to put that word in inverted commas slightly because when you pick it up, there's, uh, there's a fair bit of peat. So, uh, yeah, talk us through this one, Anthony. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, as Arthur alluded to, we, we, um, we're a farm distillery, so we grow some of the, the barley that we use in, in the process, and, and so it's barley to bottle. Uh, and this uh, dram you have in front of you, it's 100% Isla, so we call all our releases from our own barley 100% uh, Isla, uh, uh, all from the farm where the distillery is located. Um, and we did do a small batch of unpeated at, at one point. Um, now, uh, the 100% Isla range is, is all lightly peated compared with uh, the majority of what we released, which uh, the other three sample bottles you have are all from malt we buy from the commercial maltings here on Isla, uh, owned by Diageo, and that is a much higher peating level at, at 50 parts per million of phenols. Whereas the 100% Isla, which normally we, we peat to between 10 and 20 parts, uh, we did a small batch of, of, of unpeated, but... Um, and I think there is a there is a slight but in this is because um, uh, we're quite uh, open about the fact that we don't have two low wines and paint receivers for for our different batches of malt that we put through. So there's always going to be a little remnant that uh, from the previous run that will be uh, part of what we were trying to be unpeated. But now, as Arthur was alluding to earlier, we put in our own. Uh, a new floor maltings, uh, a bigger floor maltings. We double the amount that we um, can produce uh, ourselves from our own uh, barley. Uh, and we've also doubled production, putting two new stills in. Same size, same shape, another mash done and six more uh, um, uh, fermentation vats. And, and now we have got a separate low wines and paints receiver, which means that when we run our own barley, we can collect it at a completely separate low wines and paints receiver into a separate... Uh, uh, spirit receiver and then into a, a warehouse receiver so although we call this unpeated uh, as Arthur rightly says you know when he knows it uh, I always know that this is 100% Isla because it's much lighter it's much fruitier it's it, it's got a, a, a much um, it's sort of lemon and citrus notes and a very very faint whiff of peat at the back of the palate but um, I, I um, love this brand because I think it uh, it showcases uh, Kilhoman in a completely different light to our, our normal standard releases of Mackie Bay and Sanig, which are our core, core expressions, and then our other limited releases. And it has this lovely freck, sort of uh, multi um, character, uh, sort of sort of not farmyardy, but it, I mean, it, it just has a, a, and for something that is now, this is 2011, so it's sort of uh, uh, getting on for sort of nine years of age. Um, it's getting a little bit of uh, uh, cast maturation, a little bit more uh, to it, but it's still light and floral. It's not sort of a, a huge amount of cask influence coming through on this. And, uh, um, you know, I think uh, it's at, uh, we've taken the strength. This is 56.4%. Uh, I think that should be on your on your sample bottle. And the colour is, is very light, but this is first fill bourbon. So you're never going to get a, a really rich colour coming through. Um, and it, the, even at that strength, it is incredibly approachable because actually this is where we've been very fortunate and uh, 
you know, set up the distillery to be able to release fairly young uh, single malts. And, uh, you know, obviously we released our first in 2009. It was three years of age. Uh, and, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to uh, know what the reaction is going to be from consumers uh, and also retailers like Royal Mile and people. Um, and so you're, you start your journey fairly with trepidation. Um, it's massively risky when we started. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the, the tide was turning in terms of people's interest and, and, uh, and consumers becoming hugely more um, uh, appreciative and, and knowledgeable about single malt. And uh, we were fortunate that people enjoyed what they were trying from us, even at that very, very young age for single malt, because, you know, non-age single malt was only just coming on stream back in 2009. And I think uh, people were starting to explore other other single malts. And I mean, I think Royal Mile will be able to tell you exactly how the market's gone over the last uh, 15, 20 years uh, uh, and is exploded around the world and, and uh, in the UK, especially in terms of people experimenting and trying different single malts. So we were fortunate in that respect because all our single malts that we release still are, are non-age, uh, although we give a bit more information about the age. So this is nine years and single cast to me uh, is the way to drink whiskey. It's, uh, it's just um, uh, something very special because you're in charge of how you drink it. And I think, you know, you drink this neat uh, because I think you try it neat um uh you nose it and and you swill it around and you taste it neat and then you might want to add a few drops of water just to open up the bouquet and, and it does do that it's at this strength i think you're fooling yourselves if you think you can taste it really well at that sort of high strength um and even though it's got sort of sweet floral notes um it still needs a bit of water to open it up and um yeah i've just added that yeah and it just allows you to taste behind the alcohol a little bit more and the, the the farmy notes really come out, yeah. I think, when you add that little bit of water. So yeah. just to, to take you back a little bit um, in, in terms of where the, the, the peatiness is coming. So you're saying there's residual um, uh, four shots and faints from a previous peaty distillation that are left over and then they're mixed effectively with, with the, the wash as it gets distilled at this point, yeah? Yeah, absolutely right. So there's always going to be a remnant in there from the previous run that will be mixed. So you're never, you know, although we called it unpeated, I was always a bit skeptical about calling it unpeated. And I don't want to confuse people because I think when you nose this, you do pick up the notes of, uh, of a little bit of uh, a peat trace in the back of the palate and even on the nose slightly. Um, I think uh, the great, the exciting thing for me is that we'll now be able to run completely unpeated. Um, and we're doing unpeated right now uh, through the, the still house. And we know that we can call it completely unpeated because we're not mixing it with any faints or low wines. Uh, and uh, the spirit receiver in the warehouse is separated from uh, our Port Ellen malt. So um, we call it unpeated. But it is much more lightly peated than other examples of 100% island we've put out on the market. Um, and those who've tried uh, some of our releases of 100% isla, there is you will get a little bit more peat uh, and, and saltiness on the on the nose and palate than you're getting on this particular example but you know at 10 between 10 and 20 parts million fingers that's relatively lightly peated anyway um so the difference is it's it's worth having the two glasses in your hand you know the 100 percent isla ninth edition that we released um last uh, september and maybe this and to see that any market is different but to my mind i can nose all these and go i can pick out 100 percent isla because the light floral notes shine through to me and they don't have a, the depth of character that uh, our other releases from Port Ellen Mall have. Um, but uh, now that we've got this other still house, and, you know, it was a massive investment for us to do it. But I think we took baby steps when we opened the distillery uh, and didn't want to produce too much uh, and not having tested the marketplace. And I think we then had the confidence that we had a, a good following and, and that uh, sales were going in the right direction that we Thought, right well we don't want to um, sit back and just sell what we can from what reducing 100,000 200,000 liters we wanted to uh, increase that and I think that was uh, buoyed on by the fact my three sons are in the business with me and um, you know at the end of the day they're the ones champing the bit to to take Kilhoma to the next level and uh, and quite rightly we decided to to um, double production so we now can produce close to 500,000 liters 
So um, we've got a few questions coming through that I'm, I'm, I'm picking up a, a selection of loads of questions actually coming through, which is great. Uh, Andreas H says, it's really good. Please do a bottling of the unpeated. I couldn't agree more. And please, can we do one for all my whiskies? Good, yeah, next question. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but now I can say to you, um, uh, Arthur, if you want this cast, this cast is available. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, great. Well, we'll talk about that later on. We'll get, we'll get you drunk first and then we'll talk about price. <laughs> Um, so, uh, In the Mouth uh, from DB, I think that might be a friend over in Celadike. Uh, in the Mouth with Water is like custard chewets. Was there such a thing? I wrote um, custard creams, actually, which yep. is my lock. That's yep. my lockdown biscuit. I've gone through <laughs> many months of lives yeah. of that. Yeah. That have a, a bit of vanilla from the cask. And then, uh, yeah. uh, and then I think this this farmy element probably coming through from the the, the faints as well. I would, I would think I don't know, but it, it's I mean, it's, I think it makes it's light and heavy. heavy. Yeah, it's light and heavy at the same time. Right, the smoke yeah. is light, but it's got these these great bass notes. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, so uh, that's probably the first dram. Are we ready to move on to the second dram? Do you think? Yeah. No. Absolutely. No. Uh, we've mm. always done the Lock Gormers. I think this is about the seventh edition, though we now do it in, in annual releases. Lock Gorm is one of our uh, annual limited releases. And people might ask, why do we carry on doing limited releases? Well, the stock is the issue. And, and anybody who's been a distiller will know that um, the, the trick is to hold on to stock for older age releases and, and have a balance between what you're releasing at a young age and and what you can hold back for future releases. So it's a balancing act and you never ever, no one ever gets it right, but uh, we have to be careful about the stock we have um, and make sure that we look after that for older bottlings. And I was always keen to, to do a 100% matured in Polarizo Sherry Bucks. It was something that Jim Swan, who consulted for me, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, who are listening will know of Jim Swan, who, who sadly died a few years ago. He was my mentor my consultant who, who really held my hand uh, right the way through the whole process of building the distillery uh, he looked after all my cast maturation and pointed me in the right direction and he always said to me that um, you know don't cut corners when it comes to maturation make sure you buy the best cast pay the best price uh, and then uh, everything else will be looked after you know spirit character all the way through but then make sure you fill into the right cast and, and i followed that mantra uh, all the way through We've never cut corners in, in terms of our cast maturation. And Jim Swan was very adamant that uh, I bought from one distillery in um, Kentucky. And you'll all know Buffalo Trace Distillery. Uh, we've always had fantastic cars from them. And then we do the same with our Oloroso Sherry cars um, from Jose Miguel Martin uh, down in the south of Spain. And again, he supplies uh, a lot of the um, uh, famous Speyside distilleries. Uh, with their sherry casts and and uh, I think everybody who's bought casts from him will will say that they are they're absolutely top notch and and we've been fortunate to be able to to get casts from him from the day we started um, we don't fill as many sherry casts we fill many bourbon uh, but sherry plays a, a a big role in in what we do in terms of our battings for Matthew Bay our core expression and then the Sanig obviously is something that we put out as another core expression but to me. You know, uh, this Lot Gorm, which has a lot of some of our, well, it has some of our older Oloroso Sherry casts in the batting, some 2006, uh, 2007, 8, uh, and 11 casts in this batting of 15,000 bottles that we uh, released worldwide at uh, the beginning of April. And to my mind, uh, when I look at a, a Sherry cast matured, and especially Isla uh, matured, you know, if you're not careful you can uh, smother it in in sherry and lose some of the characteristics that really islands become famous for worldwide which is those sort of iodine sort of salty notes and mm. to me that's important to, to have that balance uh and i think to me this has come to the fore and it, uh, to my mind i mean it, uh, i know that people will, will argue that they like their 2019 or the 18 version but then you know one or two of them were big hitting sherry releases i think this has just got the balance of of, of sherry influence mm, but also the sherry influence but also the isla characteristic is there in the background and unmistakably uh, it's an isla single malt although it's softer and fruitier and spicier and, and and all the rest and 
you know, with that extra age, which it has got, um, with some of the, you know, from 14-year-old cars we've put in this up to nine-year-old cars. And, and although we don't, we can't talk too much about that on the label, we like to let everybody know uh, what we've used in this batting. And to my mind, when, we, when I put this together, I was pretty confident that this was, you know, to my mind was, was you know, ultimately very good for Lock Gorm. Uh, and it's the best release I think we've put out uh, since we started the Lock Gorm releases. Yeah, I'd agree with that. that, that ha- much as I've loved the Lock Gorm series, there have been a few where it feels like the smoke and the sherry are kind of fighting. Whereas yep. uh, the, these two, it's unmistakably a, a sherry cast matured whiskey. It's unmistakably an Isla whiskey, but it's in balance and it's showing maturity as well, which is, is lovely to see. Yeah, I um, mean, I think that we're, we're excited because now we've got some uh, older casts in the warehouse, you know, from 10 to, you know, four, it'll be 15 years of age at the end of this year. And, and it's great to be able to, to do a few older releases and showcase you know, the, the extra maturity that maybe we haven't been able to do so much with our Mackie Bear and Sanic releases, which are, are fairly youthful still. Uh, but we need to be mindful of, of not to diving in too much to to, um, to put in too, too many older casts into those, those battings. But it's nice to be able to, to release something like this every year, which we'll ca- continue to do with Lockdown because I think it works incredibly well. And I'm much more in favour of, uh, of butts for, for ageing long term than I am hogsheads. I, I think Hogsett can run away with you in terms of, of sherry influence. Uh, although we do mm. use um, sherry uh, Hogsheads for our Sanag releases because it, it gives that big hit of sherry early on. I think if I'm looking for long term and, and balanced maturation, butts work beautifully. And, and, uh, and this is proof of it because these are all butts that we've used, all first fill and, and one or two refills uh, that we've used in this. So just to take that back to basics, the larger sherry butts have less surface to to liquid ratio so it's a, a slightly slower in inverted commas maturation compared to smaller hogsheads which you find are slightly dominant i suppose of the spirit is that what you're saying yeah i think so i think um yeah. uh, i think uh, i would always plump for, for sherry butts for long-term maturation because you it takes a bit longer as you say so it, and and uh, and i think you you get a more balanced, uh, you know, in my view, a much more balanced long term than you might do in a hogshead. Though hogsheads work beautifully as well. Not saying they don't, but uh, if you had to choose between the two, I'd always plump for a for a butt. Um, and the the butts we buy first fill from from Miguel are, are, are really excellent. They have huge amount of influence. And and I know, sadly, you mentioned uh, at the intro the the Fino cherry um, uh, cast that we've got in the in the warehouse, and that we were going to show that and. Like no, forget like, about it if you don't talk about um, it. <laughs> but I mean, I think what, what I would say is it's a completely different animal, and, and, yeah, and it's yeah. great to be able to to uh, to be able to buy different sherry casts uh, from Miguel, who has all. You know, we're going to fill some Manzanilla um, in the next uh, few months, and uh, and we've already filled some Pedro Jimenez casts. And you know, I'm always of the opinion that sherry is king when it comes to the full maturation of your your whiskey and, and how much influence the cast has uh, and all these releases actually the ones we're going to taste now all showcase something completely different but with the same spirit that we've used and and mm-hmm. uh, i think that's uh, always is going to be in my opinion though we as a small distillery can we can experiment and and do all sorts of things um out with that at the spirit end you know in terms of yeast and barley variety but you know you can taste the spirit and you go oh, Christ, that's quite different from uh the, the spirit i ran last week but um once you put it into cask uh, and let the cask go to work over 5 10 15 years the influence of the cask is going to take over and and that that character that you had at the spirit end is going to narrow right down uh, and be something that's pretty um pretty much the same i'm not saying it's going to be exactly the same uh, but we're doing all sorts of fun things because people enjoy uh hearing about other things that you can do in a distillery other than just using the same barley variety and the same yeast variety and and doing the same uh, spirit cuts and we're going to use different peat as well from isla and 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 uh, from different cool. areas of isla and you know isla peat you know if it's cut in one area it's going to be slightly different i'm not going to say it's completely different but it'd be fun to to see if there is a, a point of difference with different peat varieties and and I, you know, the provenance of Isla whiskies is definitely in the peak that we use at the at the malting stage. 
Yeah, great. I suppose that comes back a little bit to the unpeated in my mind, in that I really love those dramas where you kind of learn a little bit more about either whiskey or the distillery character or something like that. So seeing the unpeated is a bit like seeing Kill Coleman without his makeup on or, or, or something along those lines. And if you yeah. tinker with pea yeah. or barley varieties or things like that, the, you have this slightly educational experience that I think lots of whiskey fans enjoy because they're tricking yeah. themselves. They're not just getting drunk on delicious booze. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the underlying thing is that, that every distillery in Scotland and around the world has a characteristic all of its own and then they can tinker around the outside as you say so you you know well, you're always i think you'll be the same as when you 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 buy a particular single malt that you're familiar with it will have that characters you're always looking for but it might be matured in slightly different uh, uh casts or or, uh, or um you know that that's what i find fun is that people are now experimenting a lot more than they used to and it's not just a standard product out there and everybody's looking to to have a marketing twist that they that will appeal to the consumers around the world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before i carry on that point i do love this question from edward crimes who says what do, what, what do the sons do <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah i know i know Ed, and, and exactly Ed's exactly yeah, I, know. Um, he's only, um, I think he's bloody joking uh, but, but yes, um, he, <laughs> i can explain to everybody else because he knows um yeah, they, they do plenty. Place. They do plenty. They, they weren't very hard. <laughs> different times. Um, in fact, Peter, youngest son, he joined uh, first, straight from university. Just gave him a. I said, send him down to London. I said, look, you know, go and call on all the bars and the uh, and the hotels and and see if we can rustle up some interest. And and he did that. And and uh, then my middle son James came into the business. And they're all in the sales and marketing side. So, mm -hmm. um, which actually is exactly what I needed. Um, uh, young people coming in with with uh, up-to-date marketing ideas and, and sales ideas and like an old fuddy doddy like I am uh, who trapes around the world um, showcasing Kilhoman in new spirit up to to our three-year-old and um, uh, they they brought fresh ideas and it's great to have them in the business because uh, yeah they're great you know, guys. I never imagined they would be in the business with me and it's great they've all come in and they're all very enthusiastic and passionate about what we do yeah I think I've met all of them now can't tell them apart but they're all lovely guys so <laughs> Um, coming back to that point, actually, what you said about distillery, distillery character, I was thinking about that today in the, I suppose when around the time when Kilcoman was founded or when you were dreaming up Kilcoman, I think the way the community thought about distilleries and the way they understood from whiskey experts about how distilleries tasted, it's quite different in that it would be the book was still prominent and a few writers, um, Michael Jackson, Dave Broom, if you couldn't get those, Jim Murray. Um, the um, And they would have, there was this kind of, their opinion would bring about an understanding that Old Pulteney tasted of salt at St. Anthony of the North because Michael Jackson said it and Jim, uh, David Broom's um, discussion of Yamazaki kind of formed how I thought about Yamazaki, et cetera, et cetera. Lagavulin, Lapsang, Souchon, et cetera, et cetera. Are we not ready to kind of say what Kilcoman is and what it tastes like and what those key notes are? That's what I was thinking. What What is Kilcoman now? We've got to that point. But then I almost thought afterwards, we kind of don't do that as much anymore. And I think it's the internet now, just there's so many opinions. There's almost no well, consensus. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think social media in the last 10, probably 10 or 12 years, maybe even uh, about that sort of has taken over and people can express their opinions online are much more whereas in in the days of michael jackson uh and jim murray it was very much about reading a book and 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 getting their opinions because they were the experts and who could encourage people to explore single malt uh, and they'd done it and they tasted loads of single malt. so but now i think it's very very different and, and social media i mean fortunately social media for a small business like us is is a wonderful channel to to showcase what we're doing and and uh, we're fortunate and i think any business starting in the last 15 years or so um it's it's, it's a huge made a huge difference to the audience you can reach uh, through social media channels and uh, you know before that um it was all legwork and going and knocking mm. on doors and, and uh, encouraging people like royal mar whiskey to take your whiskeys encourage their, all their uh, staff in the shops to 
to talk about your whiskey and, and rather than someone else's. And now I think um, it, it's the explosion of, of whiskey clubs and, and loggers and, and, uh, uh, and people who, who, who really do um, understand the, 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 this category incredibly well uh, have, have helped um, this explosion of, of, uh, of single malt and Scotch whiskey and whiskey from around the world. I mean, it's extraordinary. And spirits in general. But do, um, but do you, I know you're spending a lot more time now in the warehouse and putting the bottlings together and you've tasted it all the way along that journey now, obviously. Are there certain keynotes now that you think that is Kilcoman rather than smoke or peat or, you know, the, yeah, the obvious? I, think I would always say right from the word start, from, from the beginning, you know, we had this sweet floral spirit. And, um, you know, I remember when we first ran the spirit still and, and Jim was there and Jim Spawn just turned to me and said, look, if we look after this, we'll be able to release it at a relatively young age. And that was, that was great because clearly you had to wait 10 years before you, you released your first single malt. That is a huge resource and a huge amount of money you require to actually take you to that point. So, you know, that, that was a lot to do with Jim designing and building the distillery and, and helping me. I just told him I wanted a young, fruity single malt that we could uh, mature relatively quickly, hopefully, and then that the public would be interested in buying um, some bottles. Would I have dreamt that we'd be where we are today when I first had the idea? No, no, no way. Because mm. I could look into the future and see what was going on. I saw that it was around the edges, there was a huge amount of interest in, in Singapore. And I was an independent bottler and I could see the surge in interest and sing independent bottlers were, were, were really... Uh, gaining a foothold and I uh, and I saw that uh, and I just took the plunge and uh, uh, and uh, people weren't doing it at that time and I think it's a very risky business to do it but if I was going to put my if I was going to say what are the signature notes of Kilhoman uh, I would say lemon and citrus and, and uh, soft sweet peat uh, I wouldn't we're not aggressive peat it's not sort of slam you in the forehead and uh, and, and give you uh, a big hit of what a lot of the, you know, single, you know, either single malts do have that. We're at the softer end of the spectrum, I believe. And I think um, that's pay dividends because it's very approachable at a relatively young age. Uh, and I always get whatever I'm tasting, unless in the sherry, you don't get so much of the lemon and the citrus notes coming through and that salty saltiness and the, you know, sea spray characteristics, which everyone associates with, with Isla and, and the sort of peak smoke we're we're a different style um and a softer maybe a softer style than than some of the others mm. you talking about um launching the first single model that, that that business development which you know i've been lucky enough to chat to you and you sold us a whiskey early doors and it, it wasn't a tough sell <laughs> i think we've bought everything you could give us at every stage um but I remember an interesting discussion about price when it first started coming out, coming out and what to price it at. And you were one of the first new distilleries to have to price a three, four, five year old single malt whiskey. And I, my memory of it was it wasn't really based on what it cost to make because you've not made your money back. There's no way you're making your money back for a long time. And you had that first challenge and, and, and how different the industry is now. And I, I remember a long discussion about it. And I think I said you were charging too little, actually. And mm -hmm. But anyway, that doesn't matter. But now yeah, you, mean, see, I, now I you see new releases coming out at 75 quid a bottle, 100 quid a bottle, 110 pounds a bottle. Yeah. Um, it's so different from that big problem you had and a challenge that you had by going first. Um, in I actually, um, I, I was always of the opinion, I mean, going first like I did. I mean, I spoke to a lot of people, mainly in the UK, in the industry, and said, and, I, and it, was, it was something that kept me up at night as to deciding what we were going to charge for our first ever release at three years of age. And I always felt that you can't, you can't go in high because, you know, that, that's sort of uh, taking the mickey a bit. And I, and I was always the opinion that you should come in at a sensible level. Our first release was 45 quid a bottle. And I remember that mm. in all it was 45 pounds a bottle, uh, 7,000 bottles which were released. Um, and it sat 
just above the sort of 10 year old single malt price. Uh, so it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't um, sort of ridiculously expensive. And we've tried to, to we're in the long, we're in for the long haul. So we, we need to keep our pricing sensible, but, but uh, you know, on the other hand, it's not cheap. Um, but as we sort of continue this journey and we get more of a following, I think people are realizing that we're keeping our core expressions at a, a relatively sensible price. And then some of our older limited releases are a little bit higher. And I think if you're in this for the long haul, you can't go in with your first release, a three or four year old at sort of 150, 200 pounds a bottle, uh, and then expect people to come back and buy another bottle or increase your brand awareness because there's only a limited number of people who are going to pay that sort of price uh, for a relatively young single malt. So that's why we did what we did. Well, also, the thing that's so different now for the new guys coming along, which is a problem, but is also an opportunity, uh, is the collectible and traded rare bottle market is so different. It was kind of beginning. It was nascent then, wasn't it? Yeah. And I, that, that also rings a bell. Uh, you saying, well, I don't, I don't care about that. I don't particularly want Kilcoma to be collectible. Am I remembering yeah, that I wrong? That. Yeah, no, you're absolutely yeah. right. I did say that. Hmm. And, and I think um, I, I'm making my whiskey for people to drink. Um, of course, there are people out there, and there are more and more of them that are, are, are collectors, um, and we love them to bits. Uh, but we do like them to buy a couple of bottles so they can at least try the single more that they're, they're buying. So, look, I, I appreciate and understand uh, the collectible and, and where single more's going. Having been in the wine trade myself, you know, they that market went sky high with Premier Cru and, and, and all the Bordeaux and Burgundies and so on. And, you know, the pricing becomes a bit silly. Um, it's the same in the whiskey industry now. That, that, uh, that, that, but I suppose the, the argument is if people are prepared to pay the price, then pe the prices are going to carry on going up. Uh, but I think the industry has to be very, very careful not to, to get it completely wrong and, and, and try and bleed the market because some of the pricing that's been fetched uh, for some of these collectibles uh, is, is pretty eye-watering. Um, and uh, look, I'm in the industry, I'm in the industry because I like making whiskey and I like people who enjoy our whiskey. And the only way you enjoy your whiskey is, is pulling the cork on it and actually drinking with your friends and mates and, and talking about it. Uh, but we know that the single malt whiskey market over the last 15 years is, is gone crazy in terms of, uh, of, of collectibles and, and, and Kilhoman, although we're a relatively new distillery, you know, some of the prices I see uh, rather stagger me, uh, even for Kilhoman, which is relatively young uh, single malt. But, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I think if we can keep uh, a lid on prices um, or, or certainly not uh, overprice things, I, I think that's important for the long term future of Kilhoman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly like the pricing. Um, so a nice uh well, a few questions here from Adam Park. He's the director of Amber Light film that um, Dave Broom did, the documentary. Oh, yeah. So I'd love to know how you found the location for your distillery. Did you decide to make a single malt first? Was it always going to be Isla? What was the first choice you made? Um, yeah, I mean, it was always going to be Isla. I think um, uh, my wife's family uh, of, uh, had a house on Isla and then she'd been coming here all her life. So. Uh, and also just because of uh, the few, very few distilleries on a very, very famous island, uh, which was world famous around the world before we built our distillery. Uh, and then it was a question of, right, so we, we chose Nyla and then where, where's the location? Where we where are we going to put it? And then I came up with the idea, I can't build a distillery like everybody else because what's the difference? What's going to excite people about another distillery like all the others? Um, so then I came up with the idea that let's take it back to its roots. Let's build it on a farm where we can grow some of the barley and do the whole process on site. Because that's how distilling started in Scotland, you know, small farm distilleries. Certainly here on Isla, there was 35 working farm distilleries uh, at the turn of the century. And um, that's what we chose. So the location was very much about choosing somewhere where we could good, grow good malting barley. And I know people sniff about good malting barley on Isla, but, you know, we're not the only people who grow uh, barley here on Isla and, and Brewer Gladdy grow a lot more than mm. we do uh, for, for their expressions and, and have um, uh, uh, contracted a number of farmers on Isla and they grow something like, you know, up to 1,200 tonnes of barley on Isla. Uh, we grow about 250 to 300 tonnes um, and, and it's a great source of income for the farmers here on Isla because, you know, 
it's pretty extreme farming over here uh, and to get another income stream is great so it's 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 a great thing that isla has you know all these farmers uh, enjoying another income from not from from Brewer mainly and and also we got our own drying facility here on isla because there's, there's a lot of barley to be grown to be um, dried down so yeah it was basically isla was the first that was no, there was no argument about where we we're going to build the distillery and i still have the opinion that you can't necessarily plonk a distillery down anywhere in scotland uh, and expect that everyone's going to come and flock and buy your single malt. i still think that where you build your distillery is quite important um, because i think it's important to have that tradition and provenance uh, and heritage of, of single malt uh, production and and isla has got it in spade loads uh, as mm. have several other regions of, of scotland uh, but i'm glad i chose uh, isla because there was no doubt that that helped us in 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 getting our name spread around the world maybe a little bit quicker uh, because all the other distilleries at that time were owned by multinational companies uh, brook laddie was still private at the time uh, but uh, now only there there's another one obviously ardnahoa here uh, so having uh, just nine distilleries on isla uh, there are maybe going to be one or two more um, does help when we're looking for distribution around the world because all the other ones are owned by the big multinational companies and have got their own distribution networks set up around the world. And if you're looking for a, a good distribution network in certain major markets, they need an Isla on their portfolio or would like to have an Isla on the portfolio. So when we came along, uh, we didn't find it too difficult to find partners around the world because um, uh, they were looking for an Isla. And fortunately, you know, they liked what we were doing uh, and we've gone from there. Mm, great. Um, I think we should probably move on to the Ambrach. Uh, yep. A very quick question uh, before you take us through that as well, just so people can stick their noses in it for a while. Um, Brent Fraser, question for Anthony. Is Kilcoman still using STR, so shaved, toasted, recharged casks, in maturing its whiskies now the spirit is older? Yeah, no, we're still using those casks. Uh, we did an STR. Uh, small uh, release uh, last uh, year. It was hugely successful. Uh, it it uh, gave a completely different character to our, to our whisker. We got a lot of positive feedback from that. So when it works mm. in different cast types, we're definitely continuing that journey and, and filling more of them. Um, and it, it worked well. Actually, Shea Chase and Richard was was something that Jim Swan was very involved with in, with a cooperage in uh, in Portugal called Diaz, and and uh, they came up with this. Uh, um, way of treating casks to rejuvenate them, and, and uh, Jim was he persuaded me straight away to, to buy some of these casks. Um, but the one that you're actually trying now is is um, uh, is is quite fun. Fun. Uh, well, it's it, it was a cock up. So Ambur in uh, in uh, Garrett is uh, is a mess. Uh, cock up, balls up, whatever you like to call it. Uh, it was uh, and it, it transpired, and I, I'm quite happy to to be open because I'm sure it happens at every distillery around the world uh, when two vats in your warehouse because uh, we bottle everything at the distillery we had one vat with uh, Macri Bay ready to go at 46% which was a core expression most competitively priced and in the other vat we had our first ever port cast matured uh, fully matured in port cast for only three years uh, at 50% and unfortunately someone opened up the wrong valve uh, and uh, filled the port into the <laughs> Macchia Bay, uh, and um, I was actually away at the time, but when I got back, I wasn't a very happy chap, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and you thought, well, what the hell are we going to do? This is completely, it's a big problem. Uh, anyway, we didn't think about it very much uh, after that. That was in 2014. So the whiskies, Macchia Bay and, and Sané were both about three, four years of age. Uh, so we, we got them out, put them into refill bourbon barrels and just chucked them in the warehouse and forgot about them. And then uh, every year I went back and had a look at them to see how they were coming along and uh, they weren't really doing very much. And then in 2019, I thought, I, I think we can do something with these. Uh, there was quite a lot of them. Um, and, but I thought they needed just a little bit of help. So I then decided to take them out of the barrel. So they've had quite a journey. So they come out to so Mackie Bay, port cast mature, batted together into refill bourbon barrels. And then in 2019, I bought some Ruby Port quarter cast, 100 litre casts, and I then decanted them into these quarter casts to give them just a little bit of more of an oomph, a bit more. They needed just lifting a little bit with a, a bit of help from some uh, port casts, which I'd worked with before. And uh, the result is this. Uh, 
And this is a um, uh, bottle at 46% because the, the resulting batting was only at 47.5%, 48%. And so to squeeze a little few more bottles, we just reduced it down to 46%. Um, and to me, it has these sort of summer fruits character. It's quite bold. It's quite sort of meaty and bold, but it, it has this sort of summer fruits character at the back. It's interesting. It's, 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 it actually came together. And I thought, well, it would be fun to just call it Amburg mess um, and uh, put a release out there. It's only 10, 10 and a half thousand bottles uh, worldwide. Um, and it's really just to give everyone a, an opportunity of trying something that shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was a mistake. Uh, but if you have the patience to wait uh, and see what happens uh, and uh, uh, it can come together and, uh, and it has come together, it's different. Uh, but it's come together and I, I, and I, I enjoy it because I think it's, it's actually got this sort of, uh, and it's a great time to release it because it, it has got this sort of berry characteristic to it on the nose. Yeah, like red currant or yeah. like some kind of berry jam yeah. or, and with that meat. Yeah, but it's, so, and so it's, it's Mackey Bay, so it's, it's bourbon sherry, so 90% bourbon, 10% sherry, uh, and then with the pork cask influence as well at the time. And we're not sure exactly how much went into each vat, but it, it, it came out this very reddish color. So it had obviously quite a lot of port influence. But when it, over three or four years, it really didn't come together. It was, it was a bit, uh, it was unbalanced. It was, it was um, dry, it's slightly acidic. And, and I thought that really wasn't going to work. But actually everybody says to me that, you know, just have patience, leave it, come back to it in another year and, uh, and you'll be surprised how it might uh, come together at the end of the day. And I think it has worked. Uh, and it's we, it's a bit of fun, really. This uh, Amburic is a bit of fun. It's well, it's not, a long line. Not to be repeated necessarily. <laughs> no, it's 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 a uh, it's a long and noble line of whiskey uh, bottling hall cock ups, isn't it? That's yeah. uh, yeah. Arbeg yeah. Serendipity. Hi, Gordon. I don't yeah. know if you're watching. He was the chap who did that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it happens um, in every. I think bottling yeah. hall could tell some quite interesting stories uh, over the years. So yeah. The um, so uh, a few loads of questions coming in, loads of lovely comments. Can't um, can't get to all of them. Annabelle Meikle says hi. Norbert um, says hi, which is good. Uh, there's a there's a, a geeky barley question. Connor O'Hare, uh, is your barley two row or six row barley? Six row. Six row. Okay, that was quick. Uh, Connell McKenzie, who we both know, was the unpeated Kilcoman from refill casks. Well, a single cask, wasn't it? Single cast. Um, he obviously wasn't yeah. listening. <laughs> no, he really wasn't. Um, I'm guessing that's re that's refill cask, isn't it? Yeah, he needs to he needs to pay more attention. Yeah, refill cask. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, nice words from Andreas saying how much he enjoyed the STR. Uh, I really loved it. So sad it's gone. I don't think it is quite gone. I think you can pick up bottles. I'm sure it's all some in the warehouse. Anyway, um, um, but um, question for Anthony. Actually, talking. At, uh, about Norbert, who um, is one of the heroes working away in our warehouse at the moment and also um, works up at our, our, our shop as well, and the great whiskey expert, Hungarian chap. Question for Anthony, do you sell casks for independent bottlers? Well, I, I, I'll be corrected if I don't say I haven't sold one or two. Um, because and a few out there, isn't there? But very few, um, and so the policy is not. Um, we did sell a cast uh, which appeared in the Elements of Isla, uh, once, um, only one cask. Uh, we have sold a few casks to the um, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, um, but as a general rule, no, um, because we do a lot of single casks ourselves, and as an independent bottler myself, I think that's, I don't want to sell them for other people to, to sell a single cask. I'd rather do that myself. We don't have a huge stock, uh, and we do sell single casks as port, part of our portfolio to any of our customers around the world who are interested in buying them. So we'd like to look at that side of the business ourselves. Right. Connell says he was late to the party. I guess he's talking about the tasting, but generally probably. Well, that's and... pretty rude, really. He knew it started at 7.30, didn't he? <laughs> um, and Keith Hewitt says Glen Morangy 8020 was a classic mess up. And I think that was also one of Gordon's as well, probably. Oh, right. Um... Okay. He's been involved in quite a few, hasn't he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um so he didn't do a summer shift in your in your uh <laughs> well I, I wasn't aware of him being there <laughs> yeah um 
And uh, yeah, we've got North Star tuning in as well. And Graham Mackay from Morrison Mackay said, I'd love it if you did sell to Indies. Um, I bet he would. I'm sure um, he would. Um, sadly, <laughs> that is, I mean, we've been asked lots of uh, times if we would, but we've always said no. And, and we'll stick to our guns on that for, because I think um, it's important to look after, you know, to look after the brand. And, uh, and we're, we're not, in, we don't need to um, at yeah. the moment. So we don't have to, so we won't be. So bad luck, Connell. I won't be selling any to you. <laughs> Very good. Um, what um, uh, what is uh, Dunk? I think Dunk SG said, absolutely love great ex bourbon Kilcoman. I think it just shows how great their spirit is. Well done, Anthony. Well, I suppose we had the 100% Isla today that was um, what was in bourbon. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I agree with that. It kind of it, it gives room to, to show and kind of understand that spirit as we're all getting to know it. But I really like your cock up. It's good. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, it's, really it's good. worked really well, and I think uh, it shows it shows what you can achieve, and if even if it's a cock up at the time, uh, you can do something with it, uh, hopefully, uh, given time. And so, uh, we thought it'd be a bit of tongue in cheek, Amber. Um, I'm sure a lot of people out there know what that means. So, um, uh, we thought it'd be fun to just uh, to do that and call it that. Um, the uh, Simon Smith, who uh, also works for us actually uh will kilcoman always maintain youthful releases the temptation must be to embrace the maturity as it comes um yeah i mean i think um i think we're, we're evolving and i think any new distillery that starts up is evolving and, and you want to take it through to the maturation that you believe is 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 where you want it to sit so yeah i don't you know, I don't think that Mackey Bay and Sanag are where we want them to be because it's evolving all the time and we're, we're putting older, mature stock into the batting, but small chunks because of the stock profile. But now that we've increased production, you know, over the next three or four years, we'll be able to push the profile uh, of uh, Sanag and Mackey Bay, you know, older. And uh, I, I think um, I think personally, you know, Kilhoman in terms of maturation, is it going to be good at 20, 30, 40 years? Well, you'll find the odd cast might be very good, but I think core expressions and things that work really well, look, Lock Gorman, you know, that is nine years officially, if we're allowed to call it, it's nine years of age. And I think that's beautiful. It's a balanced mm. dram. It's got showcasing all those, uh, ad, you know, all those uh, characteristics that I like. Uh, yes, it can, leave it. Leave it another four or five, six, seven years. But are you going to have those characteristics that, that you want uh, to showcase your whiskeys? Probably not. Uh, and it'll be a much softer, rounder character and more influence from the cast it's maturing in. So I think Kilhoman as, as a dram, you know, once it gets to eight, nine, ten years of age, through to 15, you know, I see that to me because I've seen the evolution right the way through. Mm. It will be sit very comfortably with me at that age. And, yeah, there will be some older drams out there, but will they be better? They'll be older. They'll be more cask influence. But that's a debate for everybody. Yeah, well, I, I was. That was one question I'd written down. Was can you predict a peak? What do you think is going to be the peak age for Kilcoman to your tastes? No, if, I think fifteen probably. But I don't. You okay. know, we're not there. The yet. next one you're about to sell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, no, uh, I think. Um, uh, look, we filled some old refills, second, third refills, just to see uh -huh. how far we can take them out, and we'll all be able to take them out a bit further. But if you're asking. What has been our maturation profile? It's been mainly first fill uh, because we want that fruit and, and character coming through quite quickly because we've got young single ball. Uh, but we have tried to fill some older casts, second and third refills, which will hopefully take take those uh, those barrels will will be taken out a bit further. But overall, yeah. I think because we fill mainly into first fill at the moment, um, you know, between ten and fifteen years. Is, to my mind, is 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 a great single single malt for Kilhoma at that age. Okay, well, we I think we're just about going on to the last dram, but there's, there's so many great comments coming in. Thank you, everyone. Um, Ian Mackay asks, "Evening, gents. Great conversation. Question for Anthony: How relevant does he find the regional whiskey festivals for developing and promoting the brand, and can he quantify the feedback from these events into the growth of the band? How relevant are they?" Not very relevant for the next six months, I would say. <laughs> not, not, not right at the moment in time, seeing as we're supposed to be starting the Whiskey Festival on Ida uh, on Saturday. But look, I think they're, they're, they're a great way of showcasing 
uh, your your brand and your your whiskey. And I and I think that the advent of uh, festivals ha has been brilliant way of showcasing any any brand and especially a new uh, distilleries brand. And and we've we've um, we've been to many 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 uh, shows and and it's a great way of getting in front of a new audience that maybe not have tried your your whiskey and and of course you know here on isla we have a great festival that's been running for 20 25 30 years and it's a, a magical week whoever anybody who's been uh, and uh you know um we have a, we everybody has a showcase day uh and everybody does a, a special release and and no doubt you've heard that we've done our festival release already because we wanted to get it out there before our virtual open day um and uh, we've done a 12 year old um uh, bourbon you know in uh, 11 12 bourbon barrels and you know uh, it got snapped up incredibly quickly it's it's um they're very very popular these festivals especially the the regional ones you know Campbelltown have their own one as well and isla has one space Isle has one and then there are lots of other uh festivals you know the whiskey fringe i mean we've been going there since we started you know, i think 14 years or i think we bought our new spirit when we first started so you know they're That's a right. great way of showcasing your whiskeys yeah yeah good well thanks for the kind words about whiskey fringe it's going to open the floodgates from people asking if it is it going ahead we don't yet know wait for a bit more government advice by the way thank you luke for all your government updates i see there's a chap called luke who works for the government who's um who's actually tasting along today they've been really helpful thank you luke um but we are yeah we can only cancel it once basically whiskey fringe and um so we're just holding off a little bit for the very small chance it could happen or we could postpone it but anyway uh, we'll come back to that um so uh shall we talk a little bit about the uk small batch so yeah. this is involving madeira casks yeah so small batch is is something you know my uh, my sons uh, came up with the idea of a small batch and this was about um uh adding a a, a different cast type to the to the general mix of bourbon and, and sherry influence uh and um adding something extra to give it a different dimension so the uk small batch which this is uh has had madeira at about sort of 20 percent madeira uh, added to the to the vatting to just give it a, a different twist. Um, Madeira tends to work pretty well with our spirit character and, and uh, it, it, it has these bold sort of strong notes that seem to work very well with, uh, with our sort of characteristics. And um, so the small batch is very much about, we've done a Belgium, we've done a Fr France one, we've done a USA one, we've done a German one. Uh, and it's about just showcasing and getting another release of, uh, of uh, Kilhomin into the market and, and um, uh, it's sort of just promotes kill home and generally in, in a di under a different guise. And I think, uh, this is, um, uh, at 40, uh, what is it? 48.3%, um, launched in the UK, uh, last, um, last autumn. Um, and you didn't get, get a different character on the nose immediately. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in some ways, it's not similar to the Amburic. It's very different from the Amburic. It doesn't have that sort of summer fruits character at all. Um, uh, yeah, I put kind of sugared almonds, nutmeg or cinnamon. Well, there's nutmeg, um, I think, there, yeah. Yeah, and cinnamon. Mm -hmm. And cinnamon, it's, but yeah. Um, a little bit of spice on the back of the palate. Yeah, kind of baking spice, baking yeah. cupboard spice, yeah. that kind of thing. But there is that underlying sort of West Coast character. You know, you've got... Mm -hmm. You've got that saltiness and you've got that sort of soft sort of peaty um lingering character on the back of the palate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so norbert's back he asked about your i don't know how you say this one Com comrade 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 Com Bot Com yeah comrade another, another, another yeah. marketing idea from the young generation um <laughs> this is about uh us being able to promote kill Homan in a collection of bars around the world um uh, and a special release of the Comric. Um, Comric is, um, is is a term, is sanctuary. Uh, so there were stones on either. If you were within the stones around a church, you were in the sanctuary uh, and you were, uh, you couldn't be t thrown in jail and things and you were protected by the, uh, by the church. And so we just came up with this idea to try and um, uh, get bars, uh, whiskey bars mainly uh, uh, in different countries uh, who were interested in in uh, taking our full range so that they would promote our full range and for 
their help in promoting Kill Home and they would get a special bottling, which is called the Comrec. And each year we release a special release just for uh, the Comrec bars around the world. And uh, there are some, no, I should know, uh, there are a few in Edinburgh. Uh, there's two, I think. Um, uh, and uh, right now, I'm not sure of their names. So I have to well, ask the boys it, to it, help on that one. Yeah, it's but not especially relevant at the moment either. I think uh, no. I, I, feel, I feel about morals, maybe one of them. But um, yeah, I think uh, you might be right. So, yeah. so the, and Bobo the maybe. Release is very much. It's not a a general release. It's only available through these bars that support the promotion of Kilhoman by having our full range available on their bar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots of comments on the on the tasting notes of the small batch, which I, I totally agree with. Uh, salted caramel, toffee, yeah. um, that, that kind of thing. I, I was thinking of like a kind of toffee as you cook it. Um, yeah. That, those kind of uh, flavour notes, um, which is uh, yeah, which is excellent. Um, we said we'd keep it to an hour. We're, we're pretty much there, which is good. Um, but uh, have we got Linda Love saying salted caramel? Um, Few people are going to tune into your uh, Feshal online tasting, so presumably you've you've sent some packs out for that as well. Yeah, we've sent two lots of packs. We've been doing this. We did it uh, up to the other week, and and then for the festival, our open day on the twenty eighth, Thursday twenty eighth, we've um, we've sent out two lots of packs: core range pack, uh, Macabre, Sané, Kilokorm, and one hundred percent Ida, uh, which uh, George and, and Peter sons are, are doing that, and then. Later on, I'm doing a, a slightly sort of more geeky <laughs> tasting where we're doing, uh, we've sown different barley varieties in our fields and, and uh, they've been in cast for a, a, about a year. So we're doing a tasting with different barley varieties, uh, which is very interesting because they are different. Uh, they're not mature, but they're different. And then we're also doing, a, uh, we've sent out samples of yeast varieties uh, because it's something else I'm very interested in, and excited about trying different yeast varieties um, through the process and seeing the different characteristics that come through. And so we're doing that as well. So I'm, I've sent a pack of four out and um, we're doing a tasting on yeast and barley varieties. Uh, and uh, we've sent out a thousand packs and, and we sold them all um, to people. And hopefully they'll be tuning in for that. And then in, in the evening, we're doing um, uh, the festival bottling uh, uh, sample as well, which clearly we've sent those out. and. Uh, and um, people will be able to open their bottle and, and taste it along with us. Mm. Just, uh, I'm sure you'll talk about it a little bit more, but um, uh, I haven't got a pack of those, and I don't think I can bear to tune in and watch other people drink delicious whiskey. <laughs> um, but, so the yeast varieties, and I suppose this question comes to your floor malted barley as well. Yeah. Does it feel very different when you're distilling, quite apart from the flavoured parts, like in terms of yield and kind of performance in the washbacks and in the stills? Um, is it very different to kind of work with? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, it was a steep learning curve when we did our own floor maltings because you go along to Laphroaig and Beaumont and they were hugely helpful, but it's really about your own trial and error and seeing how things work. And we've we've got better at it each year and, and uh, yields are getting much better now and we, because we've got it more under control and, and we can dry it down a lot better than we used to and various issues with that but uh, i think um uh, it uh, it's it's a heavier and it there's more we weren't screening it properly we we weren't looking after it through the system but now i would say we're almost as efficient with our our own maltings as, as we as with the malt we buy from uh, port ellen where they're obviously uh, you know doing it on, uh, in drums and, and 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 much more controlled than we are which is on a floor and and the drying of it down so I would say, uh, and we do it in small batches anyway, um, we've got a hell of a lot better over 14 years of doing it. Uh, and now we're at the situation where our yields, and we talk about yields, everybody talks about yields. Um, peated variety with the Port Ellen malt, with the heavily peated, it does suppress your, your yields a little bit. So we're getting between 390 and 400 litres uh, a tonne now, which, which we're delighted with. Uh, other distilleries further north who don't are unpeated will be getting higher yields um but we're happy with that and then with our own it's probably around uh 385 390 so we're, we're pretty happy with that as well and to be honest you know is it everyone says it must be much more expensive to do your own floor mortings it isn't because we do it in small batches we do not 
have a, a, a full team of malting guys looking just after the malt. The guys who are in the still house look after the malt um, as well. But, and doing it in small batches allows us to be able to, to make it pretty efficient. Uh, but the main thing for me was actually showcasing uh, that side of it and also growing the barley so that people look upon Kilhoman as a slightly different distillery that can handle all aspects and all parts of the process. Uh, and uh, to me, that was key in, in terms of being able to showcase yourselves a little differently from everybody else. Well, coming back to difficulties to, to working with it, you know, for, as a, a retailer, but also a whiskey fan's perspective, you know, that's reassuring. That's nice to hear. You know, I'm sorry for your troubles, but at the same time, we don't want it to be easy. We want it to be skilled. You know, we, mm. you guys tell us how whiskey making is a skill. It is a craft. And if you could just pick up this time honored craft overnight, such as malting, then that would almost be a wee bit disappointing. You know, it's, yeah, uh, I know. And uh, I think it's been a, it's been a hell of a learning curve. And, and now, you know, with this new floor that we've got and, and definitely with our kiln, you know, the drying is the crucial thing. The drying of your malt, um, is, is the crucial thing because if you don't dry it down uniformly you're going to put it through the mill and you're just going to waste it because it won't uh it won't uh, break open uh, the corns it'll just crush them and uh, and that's a complete waste so you know um looking after it and the guys the same guys have been with me for for a number of years looking after it and and they're they're keen to 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 learn and you're always learning about your more things uh, you never stop learning uh, because it is a, it is an art which is a lost art now in many distilleries because you know, the, the industry has gone on uh, in a massive way. And so most distilleries now buy from commercial maltings, quite rightly mm. so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll come on to, uh, uh, well, a question from the pikelet just to let everyone know. He, he asks, so when does the, mis the mistake come out? And come out the amber ash, uh, immediately after the end of the tasting, we'll put up a slide that has all the prices, release dates, all that kind of stuff. So the commercial thing, but we're not trying to sell you anything. Um, the uh, uh, so authentically Rebecca loved the unpeated, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I, I found a really, really interesting whiskey. Um, uh, let's see, looking forward to that mistake. Uh, lots of people. Joss Grizel says hi, lovely chap I met uh, up at uh, Glendronach. Um, DB is asking if we sell the unpeated. Um, no, we don't yet, but um, I would love to look at buying a cask. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, Alan Wong describes a floral nose similar to Lafroy High Grove 16 half bottle, which is a great whiskey. So that, 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 that's an excellent compliment. Um, I think we're about there on the Anthony. Have you, have you had your tea yet? Are you, are you champion? No, no, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's on the plate tonight? Well, I think I'm getting at some sort of pork burgers or something, a handmade pork burgers, I think. Fantastic. Uh, apparently on the menu, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, we really appreciate the time and for sending all the drams over. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed um, this little chat and the whiskies, of course, four super, super drams. And um, yeah, uh, thank you for taking the time and chatting to everyone and for everyone who's contributed. I'll, um, I'll we'll say goodbye now, Anthony, and um, okay. thanks Well, thanks again. very much, everybody, and uh, hopefully see you on our uh, in not too distant future. Yeah, enjoy the face. Yeah, enjoy the face. Um, yeah, in in a different way. We'll um, try. <laughs> yeah, great. Excellent. Okay. Cheers, okay. Anthony. Okay. okay, bye. 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 Uh, great. So, as I said, what a lovely man, um, and really interesting whiskies, and we really appreciate uh, everyone who's tuned in. Loads of people have stuck around as well, um, and uh, and listened to what Anthony had to say. So uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. It was really good fun. I I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so as I say, as as I um as I say goodbye, I will um put up this screen here. I should be able to carry on talking. Yeah. So thanks for watching. Uh, these are the three bottled whiskies. The unpeated um, isn't uh, a sellable product as such. Um, so, uh, and then a release date. So the Amberach, which is the new one, we've got a little bit of the UK small batch coming over of our allocation, then it's away. Um, and uh, 
planned yet, but the Anne Burak is Tuesday. Uh, we're going to put that online if anyone's interested in that. And the Loch Gorm is, is, is on sale at the moment. We've got a fair bit of stock of that one, uh, which is good. Um, the next thing I just wanted to mention was our next uh, Royal Marwiski's online tasting. So this is with Morrison and Mackay, Leanne Moore and North Star Spirits. So I'm bringing together three uh, slightly smaller independent bottlers in an all-star tasting. So they've all picked two really amazing drams, um, some absolute beauties in there. Um, and I'm going to host it as I have tonight and bring in uh, the three chaps from these companies, Greg, um, Graham and Ian, uh, in and out, and we'll have uh, a chat through these six drams. So there's going to be another tasting pack we're going to put online also on the 26th of May, actually. Um, uh, sorry, no, Amber Axe the 28th. So that's good to have panic for a moment there as on the same day. So Tuesday, 26th of May, 11 a.m. Uh, the tasting's happening on the 10th of June. And um, yeah, details will be on our website. But there's only about 110 packs of those ones. 35 quid, I think, and six really interesting drowns. So, um, yeah, um, thank you, as I say, for uh, coming along um, and uh, for supporting Raw My Whiskies and, and Kilcoman Distillery. And we hope you have a lovely rest of the evening. Cheerio.